It's blue, baby. And it's dope. And this and is this blue. Is blue. Dope. Dope. Yes. <laughs> so today we had the opportunity of sitting down with Kalila Wright, founder and CEO of Mess in a Bottle, which is an accomplished designer and trained architect who has collaborated with the likes of recording artists like Rhapsody. Uh, media giant YouTube, who doesn't know YouTube? I don't even have to say media giant. Y'all know already know the vibes. Uh, Warner Brothers and just countless others. The list goes on and on. Her resume, yeah, speaks, speaks volumes. Speaks for itself. But we're going to get into her yeah. brand heavy. Just talk about the entire brand. All of her challenges that she's faced. And really her rise to the top. So let's get started. Yes. We have none other than Kalila Wright today, messinabottle.com. You might have heard of the brand. What's up, Kalila? How you feeling? Hi. Thanks so much for having me. No doubt. No doubt. It's, uh, it sounds like uh, exciting times for you. 50,000 bottles moved. Is that correct? It is. It is. It's, it's pretty, pretty big. And, and climbing. And even more. More coming. Yep. And, and I mean, I could do some quick math here, right? But you know, when we look at how much you're selling them for, it sounds like you hit a milli. <laughs> we passed the milli. There look you at go. Us. Yes. <laughs> that's that's some serious revenue there. We we gotta we gotta take it back, right? So you're from Yard, right? That's I am. Heard. I was born in Jamaica. Yes, I was. There you go. What part? I was born in Kingston. And but my family is from a um is from like the country. It's called Portland. Nice. Okay. nice. No, Port Antonio, no yeah. And so it's real quiet, real country, real serene in Portland. There you go. My wife's Jamaican, so you know, I got half Jamaican kids. That's it. But um so from Jamaica to Brooklyn. Yep. Right. We migrated uh, to be- Brooklyn when I was uh four years old. What part of Brooklyn? Uh, Crown Heights. I mean, the best part. I don't know about that, um, but I feel like I know. Like, 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 like. All right, fine. We from Brooklyn. I know. All right, fine. I'm sure somebody from Flatbush or the East New Yorkers or you know the, those the people would definitely or the, they would definitely beg to differ. No, but that's what's up, though. Um, so what what happened uh, from the transition from Brooklyn to Baltimore, like when did when exactly did that happen? So I moved to Baltimore um, for grad school. So I was going to grad school at Morgan State University, and you know, and I ended up staying here. I wasn't trying to live in a basement um, in New York, <laughs> is what it is. Um, so you know, I took my I, I took my you know I took my eyes out of state, and I was like, you know, I probably do better in another state that wasn't too far, you know, from Brooklyn. So that's, that's what got me to Maryland. Um, so I, I went to Penn State University for undergrad. There you go. And so, then I so went you to moved Morgan around like Tupac grad. from New York to Baltimore. I did. I did. I was, you know, selling the education keys, you know, in um, <laughs> Baltimore. So, you know, I was moving that way from state to state, like Biggie said. There but, you, go. you know, it was my education <laughs> weight, you know, so... You know, that's, I mean, where, it, it, that's where him and Cameron, they said, come to Baltimore. They mm, said that's where you can mm. move things around. So, you know, I was like, all right. I, I mean, I, I think they would move some different stuff, but hey, you took that hustler's mentality. I don't know what they were doing. But they said from state to state, and they said money was money was to be made. So I said, that's you know, true. I might be able to do that. You so that's key. what happened. That's, that's what I did. And I mean, you know, 50 says a Baltimore love thing going on out there too, right? They got that going on. So you got stuck in Baltimore or you, what happened? How, how'd you get stuck and stayed in Baltimore? You know, after grad school, I was trying to figure it out. 
And it was just one of those things where, again, it was close enough to New York. It was close enough to Jersey, close enough to a Philly, close enough to D.C. Mm -hmm. And so my dad always lived in Maryland, but he lived um, he lives closer to D.C. He lives closer to um, in the PG area of Maryland. And so, you know, for me, I felt like Baltimore was such a hub where I didn't have to live in New York, but I could always go back and forth. And it didn't feel like a difficult, um, you know, to go from one place to the next. So I decided, you know, to make Baltimore home, and I've been here for about 12 years now. And then Baltimore found you under armor. It did, it? it did. Now, there's a magic moment in a career when the realization of creativity and passion just meets at an intersection of purpose. With Kalila, formal training with her architecture helps her along the way as she designs the mess in a bottle path. Yeah, you know what, you know, and that's why I tell everybody there's there's no mistakes made um, because, yes, I ended up at um, Under Armour and I was doing some design work, doing architecture because architecture is like my first love, my first passion. And so while I was at um, at Under Armour, that's when the entrepreneur bug like really bit me. That's when I started Mm -hmm. to really, you know, dabble in entrepreneurship and try to figure out like what did I want to do with it and, you know, in the fashion I think the fashion bug was always a part of me being in New York. Like I will always, you know, I always love fashion. You know, I think most women, most girls growing up, going to school in Brooklyn and going to school in Manhattan, you know, it's just something about the fashion scene in New York that just really stays with you. So I think that um, I just really merged my love of entrepreneurship, design and architecture Mm. and fashion to then start um, my company. Yeah, that was one of the questions. I'm sorry, but that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Um, Was the love of fashion or the pursuit of fashion always been a thing for you? Or did that just come about, I guess, once Under Armour came about? No, I think I've always had a love for for passion, um, for fashion. I think that I've always, um, really loved, um, you know, I worked at, um, at Abercrombie, at Anthropology, at Banana Republic, at Bloomingdale's, you know, and I was frequently the person to like, look at Saks Fifth Avenue, the store windows. So I was more really intrigued by like how, um, pieces were put together and what were new mm. pieces, new fashion, new things that, you know, would come to the scene. Um, so I went to art and design high school in Manhattan and I would frequently walk up and down, you know, Fifth Avenue and go to the Celine store or, you know, mm. um, uh, all these high, high end stores. And I would just love to see how they put the store windows together, how the displays so I think now that I am in the position, like it all makes sense now. Mm, mm. But you didn't necessarily see it then. I didn't. Um, I didn't. I definitely did not know um, that how it will all come together, you know, and it's been beautiful how the vision and the mission. And I think that I've just been on that path. And I had no idea how it was going to come together. Nice, nice. Well, so you're at Under Armour. You're, you know, doing the architect part, right? But then you kind of lean over and say, you know, this is the time to start my brand. So let's let's hear about that piece. Like, what was it like for you in that initial stage? Well, so my son was about two years old at the time. And I just, um, my son was two. And I just knew at that point that working a nine to five was cool. But when I thought about the financial, like I was just still struggling, trying to figure out paying my student Mm. loans. And, you know, it's just all of that. And I just was like, this is just, I'm still struggling. And like, this makes no sense. And um, I just knew that I had to figure out and kind of bet on myself and figure Mm -hmm. out like how to follow my dream and figure out what my true purpose was. And um, I was sitting at my desk one day and I started creating T-shirts um, with messages mm-hmm. on them, but it didn't have a name. I wasn't sure if I was developing it into a company. And there were riots happening in my Baltimore City neighborhood because of mm-hmm. the Freddie, uh, Freddie Gray mm-hmm. 
Um, so Freddie Gray, an African American male, he died while in police custody. And so right. because of this, um, mm. you know, very similar to George Floyd and what's happening now, you know, people really had the people wanted to have a voice. People wanted mm. to have something, you know, to really be able to yell like they were frustrated in their community and their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I decided to start Messing a Bottle as a way, um, as a form of communication. And so um, I wanted to give a voice to the voiceless. And um, mm. I was sitting at my desk at Under Armour and uh, Chance the Rapper has an album called Surf. And, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. um, and so when I looked down, it was actually a message in a bottle. And this was the way it just really connected to me where Mess in a Bottle is the 21st century version of the 310 BC concept of receiving a message in an ocean. So like mm -hmm, us wearing mm -hmm. messages are like really giving someone a message in a bottle. So I love that. I think it's so dope how you kind of piece it all together. And I think for me, you know, I go by blue, right? Something that simple. And I mean, how surprised were you? when you realize that mess in a bottle wasn't, uh, you know, something that was kind of captured out there that you could actually build your brand off of that. What was that feeling like? And what was that surprise like? Yeah, you know, so of course, the term message in a bottle, you know, it was taken and I was just like, but I didn't allow just even a name like I was able to skip over it. And I'm like, we're a mess. Everything is a mess. I was like, this is a mm -hmm. mess in a bottle. It's yeah. not just a message in a bottle. And I think that unfortunately, people let, you know, like small things get in their way and kind of stop them from letting their brand blossom. And so for me, I was just like, no, like this is my message and I got to share it. And so that's really what I focused on, and that's what I did. I mean, it's crazy because we're still in a mess. <laughs> it's still a mess right now. <laughs> still a big mess. Like, everything around us is definitely a mess. Now, I think I'm, I'm going to say, you know, maybe the fact that you were architect and you thought of a unique way to, to actually package this, to actually put it in a bottle. And besides that, you have the whole vending machine. So was that really connection from the architect side of you or the design side? How did that come about? You know, I wanted a vending machine. Like it wasn't like probably like a year into the idea. I really thought about like this innovative way of spreading the messages. And that's where a vending machine came into play. But, um, you know, the bottles were just a significant part that really came to the business from the beginning where I was like, you know what? I want the message to actually be in a bottle. So I think that as the idea progressed, it really made me think of, you know, how to be able to spread the message and then, you know, put it into the vending machine and having people really be able to get their messages anywhere, um, anywhere they are in the world. Gotcha. I mean, I love the concept of it, just having the convenience of a vending machine that you can just go to pick a one and it just pops up and you have like a ready-made t-shirt in yep. a, a really cool container that's yep. re and then the container itself is reusable Usable. over and over again so yep. it's very very innovative and i just want to give you a compliment on that like just the innovation of all of that is just amazing and you're definitely you. embarking on new territory so we love to see it thank you I mean, no, um, right now, go ahead, go ahead. No, I wanted to, not to uh, relive traumas, but we, mm -hmm. we really want to see where the, 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 the breaking point happened in terms mm -hmm. of a shift. So let's go back to when the store in Baltimore, the first store in Baltimore mm -hmm. had a... Uh, Intruders, like you had a robbery in the store. So yeah. In a moment when bad things happen, it takes time to overcome the pain and feel safe again. And it's okay to take that time, but have to keep on moving. Yeah. Um. So in 2017, um, you know, after we first moved into our like first studio retail space, um, you know, two young men came in. And, um, you know, held me at gunpoint and it was an armed robbery. And it was definitely a very traumatizing experience. But I think what, you know, and it took me probably a year and a half to really, 
you know, get through it with therapy and everything else. But I think what it really showed me and taught me um, is just more or less like just life in general. But um, anything that you truly want, there there's going to be things that become obstacles. There's going to be things that out of your control, like, you know, so when it came to the robbery, it just was something that was out of my control that happened. And so, you know, I thought about it and I think my way of coping is like, you know, what if you um, you're doing really well and your parent dies, which people deal with every day or what, especially right. even right now with COVID or, you know, like just unexpected shit that you just don't even know is is there that will happen. And I think that um, for me, I had to realize like the robbery Yes, it happened to me, but I cannot allow it to like really take over my life and stop me from the things that, you know, I truly want to accomplish. Um, so I think that it, you know, if you put things into a perspective, into perspective, so whether your parents die or a spouse gets really sick or right. you know, whatever it is, we don't want it, but it's just like, well, what are you, how are you going to deal with it? What are you going to do to get through it? Because at the end of the day, like you have, you, I mean, listen, you could lay down as long as you want. And I was told this, you know, my therapist is like, you can take a, a month, a year, you know, several years from what you've experienced. Um, but I decided like, you know, I had to keep going and I had to get up, you know, it, it, that's just it. I mean, most people would have probably ran back to New York. Maybe, but look, I already know. See, New York already built me up to a place that they like. You're not gonna let these go. They not. That's not where you from. Fact. You know. That's so it. I was like, I had to. I had to look. All I kept on saying was, people get robbed every day, B. Like, and somebody else. You know, so this is just unfortunate. You gonna be alright, Kalila. I was going to be all right. This was just, this was, unfortunately, it was just, like Mitch said, you know, people uh -huh. get shot every day, B. So we're going we gonna to pull it together. And, you know, and that's what I had to do. So now at that point, how many employees did you have when you were in the store? I only had like one employee and maybe somebody helping me online. Okay. So I only had maybe one or two people working for me. Um, but since then, our business has grown to, we probably, I mean, we have about like 16 to 18 employees. Wow. Now. Wow. And, um, wow. And, yeah. And they're black women. So um, nice. I've been really, really blessed to be able to, ex you know, extend and have, um, you know, black women to help me to, to drive this train. So. 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 Um, so. I know other entrepreneurs would definitely love, to, especially retail entrepreneurs, would definitely love to know uh, what process did you have in terms of building your team and building a loyal team at that? Because I think that's usually mm. the the issue. It's like, okay, we can build. Okay, somebody can see what you're doing. All right, cool. I'm down for the cause, but building that loyalty because we know people have nine to fives people have other things going on in their lives so how do you build something concrete with a loyal team yeah I think that um you know having a loyal team is definitely not easy to do um I think it's it's trial and error it's gonna take um someone really working with you, seeing, you know, how, how it is to then, and really figure out, all right, you know, this is, this is the person. And it's taken me quite some time. I think that we've solidified like our core team. And again, things will shift, things will change. They might want to move on. Like, it's just so much, but I think like just finding good people, making sure that these good people are great at what they do and then keeping them happy within that space and keeping communication open. I think that's also the biggest part. I think right. having a lot of communication and being able to really talk to people and say, are you happy? It's a, rela it's a relationship, you know, it, it's a relationship and you have to check in often. So I think that, um, I think that's the biggest advice is to find really good people and have really great open communication and making sure that they're happy and that you're happy as well. Now, I mean, at, at first, you know, you take that jump like a lot of entrepreneurs. You always hear of this jump 
where you're going from a place that, you know, might seem more comfortable, right? Um, and you're going into this uncharted territory. How long did it take for you to get to a point where you decided, hey, this was the right decision and I I'm back to a place where I'm, I'm comfortable, I'm, I'm making money, I'm able to really live my dreams? Um, it took quite some time. I mean, I think that definitely between maybe year two to three is when it's like, all right, I think this is something I'm sticking with. I don't think that this is a hobby. I don't think that this is a side hustle. I think this is really something that I want to, you know, I want to make into something. And so I do think that it takes some time to really figure out um, if it's the real deal and if it's something that, you know, you can... Um, really monetize and make something that you can live off of. And that, that's a, that's a whole thing within itself. So I think definitely about like the first two to three years um, is when you could sort of figure out if this thing is real or not. Did you go into this with any type of backing? Have you received backing since you started or has it always just been kind of self-invested? Um, so we did not receive, like, we did not have any startup capital. Like I started the company with less than $500. Um, over wow. the years, I have, um, you know, raised some funding by doing like pitch competitions. Um, and those were, you know, uh, grants that I won. Um, and we have also done some PayPal and Shopify um, capital loans. And those have been really helpful as well. But other than that, we are 100% black woman owned by one person. Wow. Me. Wow. Wow. Now, are you open to any type of investment at this point or... Uh, how, how's it going right now? I'm definitely open to anything and conversation, but I would just say that I am very strategic and I am very, you know, like I've seen how far I've gotten without any type of true funding and not to say that you shouldn't take funding. Um, but, you know, I think having a company where I really started with, you know, bootstrap and you know, and really just hitting the ground and creating a buzz. Like I've made myself more valuable than if I took funding, you know, my oh, first yeah. year of business or second year Definitely. of business, you know? So I think that um, it's been really good to sort of create this thing on my own, see where it's going on my own. Um, and, you know, we'll see, I'm open to anything, but I think I'm just more strategic and, you know, somebody got to really come really correct for me to even entertain the conversation. Now I'm like, I'm not even entertaining that. Um, so they got to come right. Uh, I, so. saw, I, saw, I saw somewhere that you had a price tag of $100 million. Maybe. Listen, I just know that, you know, Jay-Z and who else? Tyler Perry just hit the billion dollar club. So that you know, right. my, my numbers done changed. A bit because I'm trying, to, differently. I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to die with a B behind my name. Okay, that's it. So that's yeah. it. Yeah, I hear that. So with the pandemic hitting all of us, especially financially, what was the shift? Like, what was the project that was being worked on for the next level of mess? Um, I think we were just thinking about transitioning and um, moving and, you know, we moved into a new space. I was just trying to figure out what to do with mess. Um, we were thinking about changing the name. We were thinking about getting rid the of name. bottles. We were uh -huh. thinking about, we were doing so much I'm glad wow. before the pandemic. <laughs> like my, we were, I was going to. My, um, we were thinking about getting rid of all the employees and like going all like online through a different system. Like it was, wow. we were thinking about a whole lot before the pandemic happened. And wow. then the pandemic hit and I had to really reevaluate all of <laughs> oh that. Um, and, you know, and I think it also showed the value of like who we were as a company, what people wanted from us and you know, how important we were to the community. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of things that was about to happen if, wow. if this pandemic didn't hit. And, you know, but... <laughs> yeah. I mean, are, are, some, are, are some of your employees going to feel salty after hearing that? That they were almost no, on the line? No, I don't think so. 
so I said, well, you know, listen, it's business and it's understanding yeah. business. And so, you know, I think that my mentor really wanted me to think about like profit margins and like, and mm. we were going to automate things. I mean, you know, we get mad when things are by the machine now and not as much by the human. But I think that you have to really think about profit and like what makes more sense. And so we were going to just explore some different options, but you know, it worked out. They still there. They still with me. <laughs> I mean, I might like, don't get rid of the bottle. <laughs> like, that's what it makes it so unique. Right. But, but that's where, right. The profit margins and, you know, and it just, it's one of those things. If you're not ordering thousands and thousands and thousands, it costs a lot. And like, you know, and then shipping fees have went up. There's a yeah. lot of factors that go into it. So it's just us figuring out, you know, what was the sweet spot. But I did realize how important people are like, no, we love the bottle. So, you know, it's it's still here for now. I mean, when I when I look at how much you're selling them for, and I'm putting on my Damon John hat right now, right? You're, you're selling it for, you know, X amount, starting at twenty three ninety five, and you're getting a bottle, you're getting so much more. When you look at what's really out there in, in regards to other brands that exist, it's so much more for a t-shirt in a lot of places right now. So I feel like there's so much value you're bringing to that price, you know? Right. No, it is. It definitely is. And, um, and I think that it's been, it's important. It's unique. People love the bottles. People love the messages. So, you know, I told myself we're going to rock out. So I think that it's just one of those things where I'm just going to have to figure it out and make it, make it happen. <laughs> Now, one of the things that's you, you know a unique idea for me is that I'm I'm hearing that you're you you moved fifty thousand units, right? So, as you kind of elevate, do you make a sub brand, another brand? Are you working on creating additional lines? We have well, we have we have a sister brand. Um, we do okay. have a sister brand. Um, it's called She From, and so what okay. She From is, um, you know, She From is uh, like you repping your city. So we got, she mm -hmm. from Brooklyn, she from mm -hmm. Heights, if you want it, she from Flatbush, she from, so wherever she from, she floor. from, <laughs> she from the floors, you got all of that. <laughs> and so I think that um, that's become, you know, like our sister brand as well. Um, I'll say it here first, even though I probably should, shouldn't, but uh -oh. I'll go, Lucy. I'm going to go Lucy. ahead and, I know, I'm going to go ahead and make sure I put in all the paperwork to trademark it before this episode comes out and somebody trying to do it. But um, I am going to probably um, gift my son probably by, I don't know, maybe next year for his birthday. I'm going to um, do, um, I think we said, I said I was going to call it in between the mess and mm. um basically like a teenager line, you know, a line it. of apparel for like kids. Like, you know, cause I think that there's a different voice, like little mess yes. is our like baby stuff. And so, and mess, you know, so like in between the mess is like the middle mm. spot. And that's when like the teenagers, they're trying to figure out their voice They're you know, so my son is far from a te teenager, but I think that he, you know, I think anywhere from like maybe a 10 year old to like, you know, 15 or 16, you know, like those ages, they really need Queens. like an in-between, yeah, right, <laughs> the in between the mess. Yeah, your See, daughter like your is in between. Yeah, she's like a little bit before the mess, right? She's, she's, she, she's not my a daughter. daughter. <laughs> she's 12 and right. I'm scared of 13, but it's coming. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so right there. Yeah. Yep, so in between the mess. So that's, that's what I'm really thinking about. Um, that's that's going to be one of our other brands. And so it will probably be a separate entity and a whole new company just for him. Nice. Like nice. Ain't it forward early. Yep, I am. I up. am. You have to. You Let have to. He got to pay for his own college. And he, got buy his, and he got to buy his own house. And, and he got to buy me a house. So I'm about to have, look, when he turns 16, <laughs> instead of me giving him a car, he's going to be buying me a car, okay? Nice. So nice. he put me in an all black range or something. Like, mm, I like setting it. Setting them up. So, yeah, so we're going to, I'm going to develop you, you, a company for him. You really, you really move like a rapper. I do. <laughs> I listen. You got the wordplay. I listened to too much Jay Z when I was growing up. That's the problem now. Go. So I just listened to too much home. <laughs> That's what it is. So, I mean, that's a good segue, right? Rhapsody did a collaboration with you, a Rock Nation artist. Like, so how sick was that being from Brooklyn and someone on Rock Nation is doing something with you? 
Listen, what I say is that I'm like three degrees of separation. So, you know, mm. since Rhapsody know about me, that means Jay, him and Beyonce already be like, oh, yeah, messing about that. I already it. got that. I already got that mess. Yep. What about you? <laughs> you know, he be asking Beyonce about my brand. She's just true, not with it true. yet because she in Houston. She still got a Houston mindset. Mm, you got to do the she from Houston joint for her. I have to. She from Houston. But that's definitely. It. But, um, you know, I think Rhapsody, I love her. It's been an amazing experience. I think just the fact to do something with Rock Nation has been, you know, I think that that, that was a good experience altogether. So it's been, it's, it's really dope. So who connected that? Did she reach out? Did you reach out? How did that process go? Her album, I think she was just coming up to doing a concert and her people. Um, so we know Shari over at, um, at Rock Nation. Yeah. And so, you know, Shari actually reached out and said, I have a really dope project that I think will be really mm. great for both brands. And, um, right. and that's how it, yeah, that's how the connection was made. And so it's been a, it was a beautiful, um, really beautiful, really humbled experience to be able to work with Rhapsody. You got the collabs, right? But who surprised you when you kind of saw that you're, you're, you're fit on somebody? What shocked you? Um, I mean, definitely Serena Williams. You know, mm. Serena Williams is like one of the most known, you know, people in the world. And so for her right. to wear Mess in a Bottle definitely had me, you know, pretty floored. Um, so I think, and then recently to have Viola Davis, uh, shout out mm. model as well. I just thought wow. was amazing because I just wouldn't even think that a Viola Davis would even know who little mess in a bottle <laughs> is. So I think that that has been a really cool experience as well. And that was on a whim. Like it was yeah. just like, she just, yeah. Women Fresh Wednesday. Yeah. Mess in yeah. A bottle. I love mm -hmm. her story. So like that yeah. was just amazing to see the reach that you yep. have at this super point dope. in time yeah super dope and i mean you, it's it's kind of cross um demographic you know uh, there's no limit you know i saw that mark cuban even rocked some some of your stuff um just look at the timeline and seeing you know different people wearing it um you know it, it, it brings up another idea you know some of the stuff you have is definitely controversial right so with all the love, have you had any types of backlash come at you for certain statements, etc.? Um, yeah, for sure. You know, um, I think that I've been um, debating on, you know, do we stay like kind of bipartisan at one point um, and, you know, not having per se a political voice or, mm. you know, sometimes we might put something that people may feel like is you know, too pro-black, but, you know, it, it had me really examine what that means. And, you know, I just had to really identify and say, just because you're uncomfortable with it, that don't got shit to do with me. And yeah, so, you know, yeah. I've just decided to, um, if I'm having a voice and, you know, and telling people to give a voice to the voice less, um, I, be proud of your stance. And so, you know, for us, I'm like, I'm not bipartisan. You know, I am a Democrat. I am not going mm. to, you know, um, just because I have a brand that spreads across the world, um, I'm not going to not um, say, you know, how I feel about even politics, mm. love, life, and anything else in between. So I think that um, it's just been, I've been just, you know, keeping my voice and making sure that it's loud. You're not holding back. And I think I think that's the piece, though, where people feel that truth and that honesty. That's kind of where they support brands. That's where the connection comes in. So, you know, it's kind of it's always a, a challenge. You know, how, how do you impact your core audience? And, you know, do you continue to expand? So, yeah, I think um, to expand, you know, um, it's always a it's always a difficult thing because it's just like you want to think about where do you go? You know, like what arenas do you play in? And I think and it's also like, do your brand and do your audience really want you in that space? Um, and it's difficult. Um, but I think that honestly, if you follow just your intuition, your direction, where you want to go, you'll start to see you know, um, you'll probably find a different audience or a new audience within that space. And uh, do you have uh, like a five-year 
time frame for what can be next for Mess in a Bottle in terms of maybe doing um, franchising, different stores around the country, different countries? Yeah, I don't know. I, um, you know, yeah, I've thought about what my different goals or, you know, every year for sure. Um, I have long term goals um, and, you know, I have some short term ones as well. But I mean, honestly, I just I, I kind of loosely um, take those things written in stone and just kind of slowly go towards them and either back up if they don't feel right or, you know, run forward really fast if they do. So, um, yeah, we have a couple of um, short term and long term goals that I'm looking forward to exploring. I mean, outside of clothing. Right. You have consultation services. How How is that going for you? And when did you kind of start that point? And when did you realize that what you've done for yourself is so powerful that other people need that as well? Yeah, I mean, I think for the past, like, maybe year and a half, I've just offered it as a service where, you know, if anybody, I think that um, I really represent, like, hope for a lot of people where people want to also have their own thing. And, you know, especially within the community and helping um, Black women, I want to be able to share. And if there are things and ways that I can help somebody, you know, develop their own business um, and even be able to then start businesses within their community to give to others um, or hire others, I think is uh, definitely powerful. I think, um, you know, one of the big things, you had a, a mentor, right? And I'm sure you still have mentors that kind of guide you. So, I mean, outside of even consultation, do you have, you find yourself with a ton of mentees now? I do. I mean, people say I'm really transparent and I'm always talking on live, always talking on, you know, all these platforms. So um, people say that, you know, they're my mentee in their head and, you know, and I like it. I think that is just a good way where if you are trying to gain knowledge, you know, I think having people, whether they are people that you could pick up the phone and call, but, um, you know, I try to give information just across the board and however I can help people, I try to. Are there plans to expand in terms of the online fan base? maybe doing um, more collaborations with different uh, online companies, like uh, T-shirt co collaborations or collaborations with different brands? Um, I mean, I think we, we are exploring a couple of different options um, for the fall and also for 2021. So I think that um, you guys are definitely going to start to see a lot of um, things coming up. And how do you stay ahead of uh, whenever anyone's successful, you start to have really other brands come in and try to copycat. So how have you been able to, you know, stay ahead of that? Um, I think that I've just really been um, just not really watching what anyone else is doing and just trying to stay, um, you know, head down and focused. And so... I've just been keeping true to my magic and what I'm doing and just really focused in my area and keeping my head, you know, looking straight. And so for me, I haven't really been, I've just, I think the more you stay authentic to you, the less you'll be distracted by um, anything that's not, you know, within that. And really with your success, have you seen, how, how do you kind of get your brand in front of people? I mean, obviously you have the different, collaborations it's about the violas and the serenas of the world actually putting your brand out but just on a day-to-day -day business type it, is it a lot of seo that you're putting behind the e-commerce what's bringing eyes to your brand i think what i'm doing is like you know i used to when the world was open back up i would just um or when the world was open i used to just go to a lot of events i would always wear masks i would always you know and even having great friends like Olivia, you know, having dope be able to wear the brands and, you know, push it to different people and ask them just to wear it and just to be present in it. And, you know, and to wear it to any great events, I think has been, I think I have a model of like a 90s street team kind of effect where people used to put flyers all over, you know, oh, all, yeah. all over the windshield after parties or whatever. So to me, that's the same type of mentality that I've had. I mean, what's your biggest advice now? You know, I think, you know, there are a lot of different people in the seat that they're thinking, hey, I want to start a clothing brand. I want to do this. And there's no necessary right blueprint for anyone. 
But what are your some some of the biggest advice that you have to people looking to get into the game? Um, I think one of the biggest advice um, that I have is just to start. I think the best advice is just to get started and like make the mistakes. You mentioned uh, you started with five hundred. What exactly? What was that like? <laughs> Like what, what? Um, so I there? bought, um, so I bought just a couple of t-shirts from like a discount store. I bought some bottles from Ikea, these glass bottles. I bought a heat press machine and then I bought like other machines from, um, from Craigslist. So all I did was buy wow. a machines, wow. some t-shirts and a glass bottle. Yep. That's amazing. So that's ground up. Anybody out there that's thinking like it's impossible, you can't. It's possible. You really just yep. have to do it. You have to start. How many shirts did you mess up with that machine when you first started? <laughs> I made a ton of mistakes. I probably still am making mistakes, but you know, <laughs> it's 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 better now. It, it regards the structure, right? Since you have this big expansion, you know, what is your company structure like? Who's Who's on your right side? Who's right underneath? And who does, are you still head of design for everything? Or do you have other designers on the team that come up with ideas too? Um, so I am the CEO and I'm at the top of the food chain. And then right mm -hmm. underneath me, I have right now um, uh, um, our operations manager. So she's the chief operations. Um, and then um, we have underneath that, we have our creative. I ha I've recently hired a creative director and also um, a chief financial officer. So nice. you know, we have a couple of top people in a leadership team, a shop manager, office manager. That So we have a couple of different people that support um, and play different roles in, at MESS. Very nice. And as you mentioned before, everything is manufactured at your site. Is that kind of the appeal? Yeah, about 90% of everything is um, created and made at Mass at our facility. And are you hiring now or ha has the pandemic slowed things down to that point or are you back? As you? No, we're good, but we are looking for some holiday help and some more people. So, yeah, we're in the midst of um, still hiring a couple more positions. Now, e-commerce, 30, 40% up year over year. I think if anything, the pandemic might have helped e-commerce, right? Because you have more people just ordering online, getting used to that. So what are your expectations going into even this Q4? Um, I'm looking to blow it out of the water. I'm looking to kill it this fourth <laughs> quarter. You've entered the podcast game too, right? And you've, so it sounds like you have a lot of a wealth of information and knowledge. What is the focus of your podcast? Um, so it's called What a Mess, and it's about love, life, career, current events, and pretty much me and like the mess through the way, um, you know, um, life through the mess. So that's kind of um, about me and business, motherhood, all the mess in between. So Now, some of the things that normally definitely help the business, like Essence Fest, etc., and the fact that you go to so many events, how have you had to pivot not having these events where you typically rely on getting your brand seen even more. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we just aren't doing it. And um, and it's been fine. I think a lot of people are doing some virtual events, but I think it's really given me time to sort of slow down and focus on some internal things that we needed to kind of really get together. So we've been using the time wisely. Okay. Now, we, you, mentioned, you mentioned B. Right. Who who would you love to see in wearing some mess that's out there? Yeah. Tiana Taylor and Tr Tracy Ellis Ross. Like those are my people that I want to see them mm. in mess on a bottle. That I can mm. definitely see. I can definitely yeah. see Tracy rocking mess. Yeah, I definitely would really love to see them both wear mess on a bottle. How has the balance of motherhood and entrepreneurship been for you? in these past couple of years. I want to say, okay, after, fine, after whatever happened at the first store, after the robbery, okay, we are, we're, we're rebuilding now. How has that been life for you in terms of balancing motherhood and this ride? Um, I think that, you know, it, it's difficult um, having a son, raising a son, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, they definitely say, you know, my village is sometimes strangers is sometimes 
um, people at the shop helping with Caden. Um, but I think that it's just he he's living a different life. He's able to really focus and see in a different way, you know, um, what his mom is like and what I'm doing. And um, and but I think it's been good. You know, I think it's just teaching him different life lessons in different ways. Right. So especially on being an entrepreneur himself. Right. In the very near future. So, right. An amazing thing. Um, yeah. Dating life. Do we have mm-hmm. one? Do, are we doing that? Like, no, I know I'm just focused on it's very, Yeah, it's very, very hard. So, like, what is yeah. that for you? I'm just focused on my mess. I got enough mess going on. So, <laughs> that's, I'm just focused on my own mess. I don't even got the time. Even if Girl, I want I love to. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I saw is that you did go through, I guess, was it early on when mess started, you went through a divorce? Was it, what was the timeline? So he, he fumbled the bag. Fumbled. He fumbled the bag. But I he realized fumbled. today that was, that was the best thing. That was the best mm-hmm. thing that ever happened. He wasn't supposed to be here for this. So that, wow. yeah, that uh-huh. was, that was the better thing to happen. That, Sometimes that's a big that thing. Way. Yeah. I mean, this is something that's funny. You threw this up today. You said, sometimes we don't see the blessings in our misery. Everything I cried over, I praise ain't in my life now. I'm grateful <laughs> these people aren't here for this, right? You didn't deserve it. I mean, it's kind of, you're just doing it and you, you're taking it to another level and you got to this point throughout your hardships. And I think that's a something everyone, you know, everyone goes through hardships and to hear the stories like this, that's the stuff that motivates people, right? Yeah, I think that, you know, we all happen to, you know, while it's happening, it's sad or you don't want, you know, you're like, how, what's going to happen? How am I going to move on? Um, But I think that I've really been learning that there is definitely blessings in, in the misery. Like when we, when we're, cause now that that pain is gone, I'm like, what was I crying over again? So um, those people are just really not to meant, not meant to be at that place in your life during that time. Right. With everything you're doing, that's, you know, so many positive pushes and you represent that. What are you, you know, doing in the communities also, whether it's Baltimore or back home in New York? um, What else are you doing that people might not even be aware of? So we do a T-shirt class and we teach people how to start their own T-shirt business. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. I think that often we are either donating shirts to people within the homeless community as well as, you know, things with masks. So, you know, we're always doing a lot to help, especially the youth within um, within Baltimore also. So with that said, you know, I think you put a lot on the table for us today. Right. We got some exclusive we got some exclusives, right? We'll, we'll give you some time to trademark it. I mean, dope. What else you got? I don't want to leave out anything. I feel like we touched a lot of points. I think we, we got a, a full of scope of mess from beginning to this point. And Perfect. we really appreciate you for that. Yeah. Oh, no problem. We are thrilled to sit down with Kalila. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as we did. Let us know. Check us out on Instagram, Blue Dope TV. That's the at. You know, we'll see you guys on the next one. You never know who we're going to have next. Word. Peace.